PowerPoint presentation that you might want to use. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. My name is Carleen Kowalczyk. I am the executive director of the Historical Society. Um, I've been here for two years this month. Um, and we used to offer these workshops in person, but due to COVID, we've moved them online. And it's actually a great opportunity to, to reach people who might have not been available to come in person. Today's workshop is going to cover documentation, um, primarily in archives and in courthouses, and what should you look for and sort of some tips there can be some unique words and, and things to be aware of when you're new to these resources. So I'm assuming if you're, you're here today, you're interested in learning more about a historical property, and that could be a house, it could be a school, a church, a civic building, but these resources that I'm gonna go over today will be helpful for, for any type of property or, or structure. So my first tip is that before you get started, um, learn a little bit about the area if you don't know that already. Um, so a good place to do that would be your local historical society, um, your local history museum. If you are researching, say, family property in a different area, it's good to familiarize yourself so you know who was there, what were they were doing. It will make a lot more sense as you come across documents and records. Um, so, and it can be something not super detailed, can be simple. Um, for Louisa County, we I would want people to know who was here before colonialization. So the, the Monacan Indians, and they were here for over 10,000 years. They moved out of the area right around the time that European colonists were moving into the area. And some of them actually remained in central Virginia. There is an active tribe in Amherst County with over 2,000 members. So they're still around, but not in Louisa County. In the early 1700s, about the 1720s, you start to see English colonists and enslaved Africans migrating into the Central Virginia region and Louisa County from the Piedmont, from the more eastern region of Virginia, and they're establishing tobacco farms and plantations. And around the same time, maybe a little bit later, you start to see German and Scots-Irish colonists moving down from up north into central Virginia, and they have more of a tradition of growing grains. And over the 1700s, that influences agriculture in central Virginia, and you see more people farming grains, a wider variety of crops than tobacco. And as the railroad gets to the area in the early 1800s, you start to see things like fruit production, dairy, meat production, things that wouldn't have been possible without the railroads. So that kind of gives you an idea of this is a very agricultural based area. There would have been lots of farms and then obviously things to support community life, such as churches, uh, schools, stores, taverns, things like that. So then the next thing that I would say that you want to do is, is gather all the information that you know. Um, and that could be any documents and it could be just talking to people. So if you're researching a family property, talk to your aunts, your uncles, your grandparents, whoever's still around, ask them, do you know who we bought the property from? Do you have any memories? Were there any buildings on the property that no longer exist? Um, so just gathering everything that you have and then starting down this paper trail to figure out what you don't know. So today we're gonna cover library and archives as well as courthouses and government agencies as two main resources for when you're researching a historic property. And when it comes to library and archives, I am gonna go over a couple examples. I'm actually gonna show you a couple examples from our archive, but uh, I actually recommend the reverse. I recommend starting at the courthouse and at government agencies because you want to track the property who owned it over time and make that list of, of people who lived there so that you can then go to your local libraries, your local archives, historical societies, and search for those people and see what information you can find. And I say that because a lot of people research historic homes and it's really difficult if someone comes in and says, I'm looking for information about the home at this address. Well, archives typically don't enter information that we get um, based on the, the address. It's usually, this is the diary of so-and-so. Um, it might be by address if it's a more modern 
you know, architectural drawing or plan. It might be by the, the house's name. People tend to name houses. So really getting um, sort of the nuts and bolts of who lived there first can be helpful before going to an archive. But some examples that you might find at an archive um, would include published records. So that is things like city directories, rural directories, um, published histories, and newspapers. And so if you were trying to get the background of Louisa County, um, I would recommend that you come to our library or the public library and you could look at a few books such as this is a history of Louisa County written by Malcolm Harris. Um, so this would kind of give you an, an overview of the area. Another published history that you might find, it's not unusual for local historical societies to publish volumes of, of older historic homes. So we have old home places of Louisa County revisited. We actually sell this. And um, if you happen to be researching a home that's already in this book, that's fantastic because it gives you the history of the house already. But a lot of people, their houses aren't included in this book. And then if you dig deeper into, um, Oh, actually, I have an example of a rural directory. So for rural areas, it's fairly rare to find directories, but we do have a couple in our archives. And so this one is actually an 1888s in rather rough condition um, directory. And it actually gives you information on who lived in Louisa County, um, Albemarle County, Orange County, and people are listed by their name, their occupation, and their post office. Um, so if you know that you're looking for information on a particular person around 1888 in Louisa County, that would be a good resource to use. Now, archives also have a lot of manuscript records and manuscripts are just a fancy way of saying unpublished records. So that's diaries, journals, um, business documents things that people have come across and donated to archives to be preserved um, for future research and use. And so we have lots of different family collections in our archives. And if you already know the person who owned the house and you go to your local archive and search for that person, you might luck out and you might find some information about their property. Not always the case. I don't want to give you, you know, false hope. But in this example, we have a lot of Burnley family papers, including um, a nanny and an Ivy Burnley, which is I found interesting because it was a woman that owned a bunch of property in the late uh, 19th and early 20th century. And we have things like fire insurance documents, which would talk about the value of her property. Another thing that would talk about the value of her property is we actually have the little receipts when she went to pay her property taxes but you'd actually be able to find this tax record at the courthouse as well. Um, and then you'll also find things like store ledgers. So we have, you know, these lists of what did she buy at the store? And you'll see, see things like nails and maybe some other materials that will give you an idea of maybe they were doing work on their property at a certain time. So those are some of the examples of, of some of the neat things that you can find at local historical society archives such as ours. Now we're not the only archive that you might want to look into if you're researching historic property in Virginia. Um, the Library of Virginia is another great resource and they have a collection, um, they have many collections that would be useful, but one that I would highlight is the Mutual Assurance Society Against Fire on Buildings of the State of Virginia. And that is useful primarily for sort of larger um, buildings. You know, if you were an average person, you might have not taken out insurance. And you, if you did take out insurance, there probably won't be a drawing of your building in the records. Um, but if you have one of these more sort of grand estates that you're researching, you might luck out and find something like this, this photo of the Brookfield Plantation in those records. Another example, um, another place to look is the Library of Congress. Um, they have some information available online. Um, some you do have to go in person. And something that we don't have, unfortunately, for Louisa County, but this is an example of um, a town map. This sort of bird's eye view town map was really popular 
for larger towns. And I don't know if you can tell, but um, there are little numbered lists on the bottom of that map. And those numbers would correspond to the drawings on the map. So there'd be like a little one and you'd look at the, the index or the key and you would see, OK, well, that was the school and that was the church. Um, and these can be really helpful when you're doing town or doing histories of properties that are in towns. Okay, oh, I, I jumped the gun and I already gave the examples from our archives. So the rest of the time, I'm gonna focus actually on the courthouse and government agency documents because I think that those can be um, a little intimidating if you're not used to the process, but really once you do it a little bit, you'll get comfortable with it and, and learn that it is, it is fairly straightforward. It's really just time consuming and it's putting the hours in. So we are gonna go over a variety of different records, how you find them, what you're looking for, um, and please feel free to, to ask any questions at any point. So where I would start are with deeds. And so deeds, um, they document the shape, size, uh, legal description and ownership of a property. Um, and it can be more than just real estate. They can document other types of properties as well. Um, and they're usually filed at the county courthouse and it will tell you the property owner's name, any co-owners, uh, where they live, if they don't live in that property, the date of property transfer, a legal description of the property, which can be um, pretty basic. Uh, and a lot of times it can be hard uh, as a lay person to sort of figure out what they're talking about. A lot of times they'll refer to sort of plat and parcel numbers. Um, so it's not gonna refer to it by the street address. It might also go over restrictions. Um, and sometimes if you're lucky, there's additional information. So you should always really scan any document you're looking at for any clues that it might tell you. A lot of times it will be straightforward. So-and-so is granting this to so-and-so at this, you know, at this time for this much money for this property. Sometimes if they're messy, they might refer to um, wills, probate settlements, marriage, divorces, um, different family matters that if they need to sort of delineate who gets the property and how and why, you might actually end up with a little bit of, of family history. So it's important to note that down. When you're looking at deeds, you're, or any sort of old record, you're gonna come across a lot of words that you might not be familiar with. And when you get the PowerPoint, there are some links in the notes section that I have found some websites that I find useful that are sort of glossaries for old terms. So if you come across a term you're not familiar with, you can check these websites to, to see what they mean. The most basic terms that you would want to know is grantor and grantee. And so the grantor is the person giving the property and the grantee is the person receiving the property. So if we look at an example of an old deed from Louisa County, and this one is an old one. So Louisa County was formed in 1742 from Hanover County. Our courthouse records start in 1742. So our, our early deed books are listed by letter and later on they're listed by number. So deed book A and B are the very first and second deed books for Louisa County. And so this deed, if we look at it, we look at it and say, okay, what kind of information, what can I glean from this? Where does this tell me to look? So if we were looking at this deed from 1751, we see that Thomas King of St. Martin's Parish, Louisa County, who is a planter, and his wife, Sarah, are the grantors. And they are giving to John Pettis of the same county. Um, who's a gentleman for 120 pounds of current money, 214 acres. And so if you've never looked at old deeds before, you might be a little intimidated at first, but you will learn the lingo. The more you read them, the more you realize they follow a similar flow um, and the more that you can sort of uh, transcribe or translate them. And so a lot of times deeds, if you're lucky, will also give you a little bit of information about where the grantor, where the person giving the property 
how they receive the property. So that's sort of establishing their right. I own this property. I have the right to give it to someone else. So in this one, we're actually lucky because, and I won't read it all out, it actually traces through property ownership through multiple prior owners, which you don't always see. You usually see one prior, but you don't always see multiple prior. And another example of where it's good to know a little bit about your local history is that as you see, they, they trace through the different owners. And at one point they talk about um, how the land was conveyed to a prior owner by a land grant or a patent. And I'm trying to quickly scan it, and see where it said that. Well, I'm trying to remember, I can't see it right at the moment, but I do believe there's a line in there that I looked before that says sort of by patent or by grant. So they'd be talking about the transition of the property ownership and they might say that um, by deed, by somebody's will. So they're describing how the property transferred ownership. If it says by patent, or by land grant, you sort of know that you've hit the end of the road in terms of when we're talking about um, a European colonists, land ownership in the colonies, because that was sort of the very first dispersal of land in Virginia. And so um, monarchies would typically either um, in exchange for if you were somebody or if you were a servant that was brought with somebody to the Virginia colony to um, encourage people to settle there and colonize Virginia. Depending on the number of people that you brought with you, you would get so much land and that was called the headright system, or you might just straight out purchase some land. And those grants were large, hundreds to thousands of acres. And as you go over time, the property breaks down into smaller and smaller and smaller chunks. So Louisa County, that's the, the story of a lot of the properties here. You might start with a little one. And then as you go back in deeds, the property is going to grow and grow and grow and grow to just a few select number of these large land grants. Now, if we were looking at the grant or the deeds, excuse me, that was on the previous page, some of the things that if I were taking notes on this, I would write down all the names of the people and the dates that they acquired the property. I would write down where those people lived. Was it Louisa County? There's somebody on here that's Hanover County. And they also happen to mention St. Martin's Parish. And so at this time, there are counties and parishes that typically, but not always overlap. And you're gonna wanna look at the county records as well as the parish records. And the parish is the local Anglican um, church records. And so we have some St. Martin's parish records here. We have more Fredericksville parish records here. So the, the parish records would probably be at your local archive or the state archive where the, the Louisa County, the court records would be at the courthouse. And I see that somebody's writing that they have no audio. Could could somebody else confirm for me that they do have audio? Um, and perhaps that one person is on mute. Okay, thank you so much. So Elizabeth, if you would check to see maybe if your speaker is on mute or not. Okay. So where do I start? Um, my recommendation of where to start is actually online. There is a county GIS website. If you visit the website that is on the screen right now, it will take you to Louisa County's GIS website. And there is a search bar at the top. And you can search by name, um, address, or by sort of parcel ID. One tip I have learned is you cannot search by more than one function at one time. So you have to choose one of those three window functions and search. 
So I did our property. Our historical society is located in the Sargent Museum of Louisa County History. We're across from Louisa Town Hall and the Louisa Art Center. We're in a historic um, 1914 Sears Roebuck house that has been converted into a museum. So I searched for our property. And once you find the property you're looking for, you um, can confirm it by clicking the, the map button just to make sure you are looking at the right property. Um, but you sort of want to look at this page that gives you all the information. And what you want to do is at the very bottom, you'll see it says assessment link and then there is a blue link and you would click on that link. It takes you to the next window, which you just need to say accept. And then it takes you to this. And this is where um, more modern information on properties are kept. So it'll only give you the last couple decades, but it's a good place to start. From here, what you want to do is click on the, in the right, all the way on the right hand side, you'll see the details button. If you click on the details button, you'll see this page. And then the last step is at the top, you'll see different tabs. You want to press on um, assess and sales. And what that will do is that gives you a history of the property, what values it's been assessed at, and at the bottom, it will give you a history of ownership and transfer of property. Usually you only see a couple because like I said, it's in the last couple of decades that are in the online system. Sometimes you will see, like I looked at my house and there was five, I think, prior sales. Um, and sometimes if it's a property that's sort of been in one owner for a long period of time, you won't see any records of sales. But what you want to do is you want to look at the bottom. You want to write down the deed books, the deed books and page numbers for those sales. Most importantly, the oldest sale that is listed in that deed book and that page. And at that point, that is when you want to go to the courthouse because you want to chase your chain of title. I did call the courthouse just because with COVID, I wasn't sure if there were any restrictions. And they said that um, it is open, but it's limited to four people at a time. It really hasn't been an issue for them. But occasionally, if there is somebody that um, is sort of working with a land company or a mortgage company, they might need to go into the room for about 15 minutes. They might need to kick a researcher out for about 15 minutes. Um, but it really hasn't been too big of an issue for them. You cannot bring cell phones into the courthouse and they can be a little picky about what you bring in. So typically I just bring a notebook, a pencil um, and some some change if you'd like to make copies. In the handout section, you will see that there is a chain of title worksheet. You do not need to use this worksheet. You can just write down the notes on your own, but it might be helpful. And it looks something like this. Um, and you would just use it to keep track of your research. It is amazing after looking at so many different records, it's hard to keep it all straight. So you write down the grantor, the grantee, again, who was giving the property, who's receiving the property, what the date of the transfer was, and what deed book and page that was. Now, when it comes to the description section, the descriptions are usually really wordy from this creek to that creek. The old one might talk about meets and bounds and chains and all this different lingo. So what I do is more, I think of it as chunks. And so I might describe, you know, come up with a, a word or a system for labeling which property you're tracing. And so you could write that down as, you know, even just like parcel one, parcel two, and so if parcel one is a smaller chunk of property, every single deed that refers to that chunk of property is is parcel one. And then as soon as you realize that that property got bigger, that can be parcel two. And anyone that refers to this one is parcel two. And then you'll notice that it gets bigger. So that's that's personally how I do it. So I'm not writing down. And then I have a key kind of saying, OK, well, parcel one is this one. Parcel two is this one. Now, something that you might find in the deed books, but it's not a guarantee, is a plat map or surveyor's notes. Um, not every property had a map made of it. And there is a white binder in the courthouse and at the Historical Society that actually is an index of, of those old plats. So you could look at that if you were, were looking for a plat map. 
Um, you'll see things like chains, links, purchase. I do have little notes there about what sort of the modern equivalent in, in feet and in inches is um, for those old, old terms and old measurements. So another good um, wealth of information that you might find are in the personal and property tax records. And like I said, you might find some tax records at archives, but you'll also find some at the courthouse. The picture on the screen actually is an example from our archives. It's kind of a unique um, sample from our archives because it is actually the personal and property tax records that were kept by the Confederacy during the Civil War. So if you look at this book, it talks about who lived here during the Civil War. And because it is personal property tax records during the time period of slavery, if somebody owned slaves, that was personal property. And you can find information about that if you're interested in finding out that information. So in terms of the, the tax records that are at the Louisa County Courthouse, um, they have the records from 1782 to 1865. They're still in the courthouse. They're in a file cabinet in the basement. Um, they're, they're hit or miss sometimes. Um, and they are divided into the north side of the county, which is west of the South Anna River, and the south side of the county, which is east of the South Anna River. So before you look at these tax records, you want to figure out where the property is and whether it's in the North District or the South District. Um, and I don't want to, again, give you sort of false hopes. The, the information can be rather limited. Um, it will be a value of the real estate or the land. It might be for personal property. What carriages did someone own? Did they own slaves? But those you can read deeper into just than, than just the facts. So you can start to determine things about somebody's socioeconomic status. You know, how many carriages did they have? Um, you can read into whether or not they owned slaves. Um, there was a large Quaker population in Louisa County at certain points. And, um, you know, some Quakers didn't believe in the practice of slavery. I will say though, sometimes that's misleading. Some Quakers did rent slaves. Um, so it's, it's always good to be skeptical um, and just sort of go in with a curious mindset. Another wealth of information is um, the wills. And some volunteers and the previous director of the Historical Society put a lot of hours into indexing the early will books. So the will books from 1742 to 1865 have been indexed. And that index is available on our on online archive website, which is piedmontvahistory.org. I have a link to that at the end of the slideshow. And so that makes it really easy. But there are will indexes at the courthouse that you can use as well. And typically, wills are good to give you family information. Um, it can be particularly helpful with women, right? Sometimes it's hard to track um, women, especially if they got married and their name changed. Um, but you might be able to, depending on when the wills were written, when the kids were married, you might be able to determine. Um, a lot of times they will list their children um, and then also the children's spouses if they if they are married. Um, so there's a lot of information that you can glean from from wills. Again, a lot of times they do touch on personal property, which can include slaves. Um, so if you are if you're sort of coming at your property research from a different angle, if you know that one of your ancestors was enslaved on a property or you have an idea that they were enslaved um, in Louisa County in a certain general area and you can kind of figure out who lived in that area, um, this might be helpful um, to sort of track down some ancestors. Unfortunately, they are typically um, only referred to by their first name, uh, but there is some different things that you can do to sort of help kind of uh, trace that ancestry. And if you're interested in that, we do have a recorded webinar on sort of how do you break that brick wall? How do you get before emancipation in African-American genealogy? And that is available on our, our YouTube channel. Another place to look is for court records. And this can be lawsuits. Um, can be probate proceedings. So if there are any um, discrepancies in, in the will, if somebody died without a will, um, you can find some information from those. And there are 
chancery court records, which are probate court records at the local Louisa County uh, courthouse. There is also an index in the basement in a white binder for those court records. But I recommend actually starting online. Again, it's nice that people have developed these online databases. The Library of Virginia has an online chancery record index. And the link for this, again, is available in the notes section of this PowerPoint. And so you can search by county, by time period, by person, if you know the name that you're looking for, and it will pull up records. Um, any record that is before 1913 actually is at the Library of Virginia. And so you might be able to see scans of those early court records. Anything 1913 and later is still at the Louisa County Courthouse. So you would actually have to go to the courthouse to look at those records. So those are the main um, records that you're probably going to start with if you're trying to call information about who lived here, who was their family, when did they own the property. There are a few other type of records that I'll just bri briefly touch on because they're not typical, um, especially in rural counties, but you might find some building permits, some zoning records, public utility records, insurance maps, and liens. Um, so the, the liens are only since 1833, and that was if you hired somebody to do work. We're more familiar with mechanic liens, but they could also be on construction. So you hired somebody to do an addition to your house, and you didn't pay that person, they would go to court. And so if a prior owner of the property you're researching didn't happen to pay a contractor, you might find the records and that might give you more information about work that's been done on that property. The insurance maps, the most um, typical and famous ones in research are the Sanborn fire insurance maps. That's what you see on the screen. Louisa um, and Mineral did not have one. It's typically for, for bigger towns, bigger cities. But if you happen to be doing research in a more urban area, Sanborn maps are a fantastic resource of um, sort of neighborhoods. It shows you who people's neighbors were, where their businesses, was it residential, what the materials were made out of. It can give you a lot of information. Now in more rural areas, the types of maps that you find honestly are a lot of times not super helpful. There are the USGS maps, which are in the photo below from our archives. You might have seen them. Um, sometimes for rural areas, they are the only map that was made of that area. And sometimes they do determine where churches, things like that are, but they're more modern from the 20th century. Um, there's census enumeration maps, which you don't typically get into, but um, when you're looking at censuses, you'll, you'll see sort of the, the person taking census will mark down sort of what region, what area. If you need help figuring out where they were, you can use census enumeration maps. And then there are postal route maps as well. And those would be located in the Library of Congress or the National Archive. You might also find architectural plans and drawings, but again, this is typically for more well-known, more established um, buildings and structures. There are a few Louisa County properties that were documented um, by the Historic American Building Survey, which is HABS and that is where the St. John's Chapel drawings come from. So if you have a larger, older home in Louisa County, um, you might be able to find a HAB survey that was done of it. A lot of them were done during the Great Depression to give architects some employment, and those are available through the Library of Congress. Now, once you've done this work and you know who lived in your property, I know I would be a little bit curious about, well, what did they do? Who were their neighbors? Um, did they have a family? And a census is a really good place to, to start and do that research. The most recent available census is 1940. So you can only access 1940 or prior. Um, typically we use Ancestry to access the census. And if you don't have an Ancestry account, the public library and our library can get you logged in and set um, an accessing ancestry. And so this example here is actually again for this house. This house was built by Frank Sargent 
And this is the 1920 census. So I looked for Frank Sargent. I knew that he was in Louisa County at that time. He owned a local hardware store. Um, as I said, he built the house in 1914. But what I learned from this census is that Frank and his wife, Grace, they were in their mid thirties. They had one, two, three, four, five, six children at the time, including a baby named Fitz. And their oldest was Lucille, who was nine at the time. And something that I did not know that I learned from pulling the census is that in 1920, there was a young African-American man. His name was Charlie Smith. He was 14 years old and he was living with the family as a servant. And from the census, depending on the different years, you can tell different information. They asked different questions. You know, have you had schooling? Do you speak English? Do you have a TV or radio in your house? Was a question they asked later on. Um, so from this census, I'm able to see that Charlie Smith had no schooling and was illiterate. And so I would be interested in figuring out some more information about the family and the, the servant that they employed in their family. Now, also from the census, typically they went house to house to house. So um, you can look at the families before and after, and you can get information about people's neighbors over time. And the census typically marks down people's occupations. Again, once you have that information of who lived there and you're looking for more information to flush out the story of their lives, you can look at vital records. So vital records are typically birth, death, and marriage records. Birth and um, birth records, they were started to be kept by the county in 1853. So, and that's the same for, for death records. Um, so unfortunately, if somebody was born or died before 1853, um, you won't have records in the county courthouse. And these records were kept by the county until 1890. Six. And a lot of those births um, and deaths have also been transcribed by the Historical Society and are available in an index online on the Piedmont, Virginia website as well. So again, a lot of times if you know where to look, you can kind of jumpstart your research by doing a little bit of research online before actually going to the archive or actually going to the courthouse. Now, there is a little bit of a funny little blip in the records, and that is that in 1896, there was a decision that counties were no longer going to keep these records and the state was going to keep these records. But in typical government fashion, it took until 1912 for that state system to actually be in place and operating. So if somebody was born or died between 1896 and 1912, you might not be able to find their record. The only time that those records exist is when somebody requested a delayed birth certificate or a delayed death certificate if they needed it for some reason. Now the marriage records, oh, and I should say that um, for the uh, birth and death records, if you're looking to figure out people's parents, um, people's maiden names, they can be helpful. A lot of times they contain information about people's parents. The marriage records often will contain that information as well. And we do have um, transcribed volumes of the Louisa County marriage records from 1766 into 1865. Those are available in our library. Um, be, before 1766, which is when the county started keeping marriage records, you would have to look at family Bibles, um, church records, family records to try to find records of marriage. So before 1766, you are not going to find a courthouse record of a marriage. Okay. So there are a few other sources of information that might be helpful. Um, if you're looking into a more modern uh, history of a property, you might actually be able to talk to builders and contractors who worked on the property um, and they can tell you about, you know, 20th century history of the property. And what they also can tell you is they might have been working behind walls up in the eaves. Um, they might be able to tell you a little bit about architectural features, additions, things like that, that would give you a clue of how the building was used in the past, um, what the property was like in the past. 
if you're interested in that type of information, which is really reading a building, that is what our second workshop will be on. Um, and that one is being offered it's in September. Um, I don't have it handy and I don't want to give the wrong date. Um, so if you check our website, they'll have information. I believe it's the third week in September. We are offering uh, another online webinar and that will be on reading a building's architecture. How was the building constructed? What do different nails and different saw marks tell you about the, the age of a building and when it was built? Um, Something else that um, is helpful sometimes if you can track them down is to talk to previous owners, neighbors, tenants, um, especially in rural areas. A lot of our history, a lot of our memory is oral. And so if we don't document it, it, it can be lost to the historical record. And you might also look out and find photographs or paintings um, that will tell you a little bit about the property you're researching. So the example that I have here that is also from our archives. That is a photograph of Bird Mill, which burnt down in the 60s. And then there's also was a series of, of drawings that were done of Bird Mill. Um, and so these are really interesting artifacts because if you were interested in the building before it burned down, some of these drawings even give you some internal um, views of what the building looked inside, what was the equipment like. Um, so this would have been a really neat find in the archives if you were researching that property. Okay. So I know that I threw a lot of information at you. So I'm going to go over um, some tips about where to go from here, um, some closing remarks, and then open it up for, for any questions that anyone might have. So... I do recommend our, our research library. It is a non-circulating library. That means you can't check out the books, but it is open during our museum hours. You're welcome to come here, um, use our online resources if you don't have um, internet at home. You're also welcome to look through the old issues of our magazine. So if you're a member, you get a magazine issue two times a year. And a lot of our local history is documented in that magazine and nowhere else. So if you want to know about a town, a church, a family, some of the homes in Louisa County, the magazine might be the only place where you can find that information. You can visit our website, louisahistory.org. Um, that website is more um, focused on programs in the museum. If you're more research minded and you're looking for research tools, that would actually be our GIS website or our Piedmont VA online website, which I've referred to. The GIS website, it has some neat um, different maps up there. They even have some historical overlays. So you can see a 19th century map that has been overlaid over Google Earth and you can kind of scroll it on and off. And so if you know that the property you're, you're looking for neighbored this property owner's property and that property happened to be documented on this map, if your property was the neighbors, you can sort of do this overlay and, and go, okay, roughly my property was located here. Um, and then the, the Piedmont VA website, that's got a lot of information and that's not just Louisa County. There are other um, historical societies and counties in the area that put information onto that website but that is where you will find a lot of our indexes to tax records, birth, death, marriage, wills. Um, you'll see the catalog to our archive if you wanna look for people in our archives and see if we have any of those neat family papers like I showed you earlier. Um, a lot of information on that website. And then the last website that I have listed there we do not maintain that website. That is an independent website, but it is a wealth of information. <clears throat> um, there is an index to our magazine available on that website. So if you want to see if it's you know worth your time to come here and look at our magazines, there's a combined index to that magazine um, along with there are some deed abstracts and things like that on that website. Okay, so my closing remarks would be um, if someone's just getting started out in this, <clears throat> be prepared to find contradictory information. You're going to get confused. You're going to get frustrated. One thing will say one thing. Another thing will say another thing. It's not an exact science. Um, so just always take really good notes. Um, 
I should have put that on the list. That should be the number one thing is note taking. So write down where did you find the information? What source was it in? You know, when did you visit that archive? And this is the information I found so that when you're reviewing all of your information, you, you have that at your disposal. Unfortunately, some records just don't exist. Um, we help a lot of genealogists remotely, um, people that can't visit in person. And we talked to some people that have been researching people or places for decades, and they're just looking for that last little piece of information they're trying to find. Um, I will say part of why I would say to write down the date of when you visited an archive is because archives are open institutions. We are always collecting things. So you might have contacted an archive in 2000 and now it's 2020. It might be worth going back and, and looking through that archive catalog again because a family member could have donated something in that time period that answers that question that you were looking for. Um, sources are not infallible, which kind of goes back to the, the contradictory information. So always be a little bit skeptical. You know, a lot of these courthouse documents, even they're being kept by people. You know, it could be somebody who didn't have lunch that day, somebody that had a bad day, and they might have just written down the wrong information. Indexes are also not infallible. So, for example, if you look at the master index for the deeds and you're looking for a land transaction that you know happened, and you do not see it in the master index. It might be worth your time. Each individual deed book also has an index. And if you know roughly what time period it was in, it might be worth double checking and looking at the actual individual deed books in case the person who was putting the master index together just missed that one. And this, the last one applies more to the second session that we will be doing, but that is when you are dating buildings by stylistic and technical features, it is an inexact science. So if you attend the, the follow-up workshop and you learn that this type of mark on a wood, this type of, of, of window casing means this time period, that could be true. But somebody in the 20th century could have thought that that door, or that window that they found on a different building was really neat and used it on a more modern edition. Um, so there's all sorts of things that can happen. So, so take everything with a grain of salt when you're trying to date buildings that way. So I want to thank everyone for attending today, our online webinars. We are looking to continue to host these webinars and we will make this video available on YouTube. So if you know of anyone who's interested in this information, please direct them to our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. If you're interested in archives and old documents, our Instagram weekly, we post a photograph or a record or an artifact or something neat from our collections. To, to, to share those with the public because we can only put so many things on display at one time. Um, we are a private nonprofit. And so of course we operate based on donations and memberships. If you're interested in making a donation or in becoming a member, the information is on the screen. And you can also always contact me. My contact information is on the screen as well. Um, if something was unclear and you have a follow-up question or if you'd like to become um, a member or, or for any reason really. Um, so that concludes my portion of the presentation today. And um, we've got quite a bit of time. If anyone has any questions, um, if anything was unclear, if they'd like me to review something, or if they would just like to share a little bit of information about a research project that they're working on. I'm glad that you learned a lot and that this was helpful. Please do um, download the PowerPoint presentation because there are a lot of live links that basically whenever I was saying go online, go online here, um, if you download that PowerPoint presentation, it'll all be available in one, one place. I'm going to wait a few more minutes just in case anyone has any questions or is typing something up. And while I'm waiting, I'm actually going to get the date of the second workshop for you. Oh, 
Okay, so the follow-up workshop, which again is going to be on um, sort of how do we read buildings? What does the style, what does the construction tell us about a building? That will be on Friday, September 25th at 10 a.m. It'll be similar, it'll be about an hour of information and then a chance for questions. Um, and again, that one will be recorded as well. Um, and so please do register for it if you would like an automatic email of the recording, or you can always visit our YouTube channel after the webinar. I do see that um, I have a question, and that is about how about finding addresses and names of folks in really rural areas who are renting versus owning the house, how to go about finding information on the renters. That is a great question. Um, I assume census records do not list address only, sequence or family number, yes. So I was gonna say that a census is one of the best ways to determine who was at a property. Um, and then you would have to sort of cross-reference that with um, the actual property ownership records, which are those deeds. Um, you are correct that for the most part, they do not list them by address. Although I will say sometimes they do. So when you're looking at the, the census record and there's all the lines, you wanna look all the way on the left hand side and that will either show you numbers and that is the sequence of houses and that is where that census enumeration map might be helpful. Um, but sometimes you'll also see street names and rarely, but sometimes you will see addresses. I would say typically you can find street names. So if you can say, okay, these people were living on this street at this time period, you might be able to puzzle it out and, and, and piece it out. Um, personal property tax records um, might be another way of going about that as well, especially if it's a little bit more modern, if it's 20th century, um, you know, if they owned personal property and that they were taxed on, their, their address might be part of those um, personal property tax records. Because obviously they don't have, you know, real estate property tax records if they're renting, but they might have personal property tax records. And um, one other place would be also those directories, but again, you are correct that they do not give addresses. So that 1888 directory that I showed you, we also have some from the 19 teens and then some from the 1950s and 60s that I've seen in our archives. Um, so it's difficult because what you'll see is you'll see like a name and then their post office. So, you know, it'll be like which, which post office they used. And that gives you a rough idea of where they were, but it's not gonna give you a detailed one. Okay. So let's see, I have another question. Will the Louisa County Courthouse let you look at the index binders in the basement? How about getting access? Um, yes, that's such a really good question. I meant to bring that up and I forgot to. So thank you, Katie. Um, the records are, you enter the building through the back. So the front of our courthouse with the big columns, you want to go around the back of the building and that is where the record room is. You do have to go past security. Um, and then as you enter on your left, there'll be a record room. And on your right, there are some windows and some, some people that work for the courthouse on your right. And so the records that are on the first floor, that is a lot of deeds, wills, marriage records, those you can just go in, there's a copier that is self-service. And once you've made your copies, you go over and pay for them at the window. If you wanna see any records downstairs, those are kept in locked buildings, but they are public records. You have a right to access them. You do need to go to the window um, and they will either let you into the, the rooms or they will give you a key to let yourself into the rooms. And when I spoke to them, they didn't say anything about them barring access based on COVID. Um, I think it's just that same policy of they can't have more than four people in a room at a time. And I will say for anyone who is not local, um, we do offer remote research service requests. Um, they're first come, first served. We're a volunteer based organization, so it can take us a while sometimes. Um, but if you cannot travel here for whatever reason, we will check our archives in our library for you and we will send you that information. We do suggest a donation of $20 an hour. Um, if you have very limited research in the courthouse, if you're like, I need this one marriage record, I need this one deed, usually we can fulfill that for people. I don't wanna make any promises because sometimes we get overloaded and we can't do courthouse records for people. If you're looking to do a whole chain of title or looking for a lot of courthouse records, unfortunately, we wish we could. We just don't have the manpower to do that. 
that is when you would need to contact a professional genealogist and hire them to, to go to those locations for you. And the Virginia Genealogical Society, most states have a genealogical society. They can typically pinpoint you to people that offer those services in, in the area where you're looking for research. So that's another good, um, if you live in Louisa and you're trying to research a property someplace else, that's another good tip. You might, it might be worth it if you can afford it to pay someone to go to that courthouse and do some of this work for you and send it to you. Okay, so I think that I've answered all of the questions that I've seen. I'm glad that people have found this useful um, and I look forward to hopefully seeing some of you at our follow-up workshop in September. Uh, I hope that everyone stays safe and, sorry, I see one more. Okay, perfect. Wonderful. I hope everyone stays safe and good luck with your research.